The Justice Department says the Attorney General will make Robert Mueller's report public in weeks, not months. George Papadopoulos, a foreign policy advisor to the Trump campaign, was convicted as part of the special counsel's investigation. He was sentenced to 14 days in prison for lying to the FBI about contacts with two Russian nationals and a Maltese professor. His meeting later with an Australian ambassador also kicked off the counterintelligence investigation. Breaking news in the Russia investigation, we are learning that a powerful businessman with ties to both Trump's inner circle and the Middle East is now cooperating with the special counsel, Bob Mueller. The Middle East specialist is named George Nader. You see him there. During the presidential transition, he was actually in the room when Trump's team met with officials from the United Arab Emirates at Trump Tower. Hey, Kara, look, I, you know, I, I understand um, the Emir Emiratis uh, felt they were responsible for delivering the Russian to that meeting. They thought that Eric Prince was going to deliver a backdoor to the Trump campaign, uh, perhaps to Jared Kushner directly. What does all of this tell us about Mueller's investigation and how it is expanding beyond just Russia specifically? Well, when we think about that meeting in the Seychelles, and a lot of the initial interest was who is this Russian that Eric Prince was meeting with. And now that we know that Mueller's team is having the cooperation of George Nader, someone who is very close to the Emiratis, he's worked with them for a while. He was involved in that December meeting Shimon was just discussing, what that was the prelude to the Seychelles meeting. Yeah. So now we're really seeing that this investigation is going beyond Russia, looking at then scrutinizing the role of the Emiratis here, which we had previously not really known that they were a focus. And the Washington Post reported the other day that, you know, the Mueller's investigation was looking at the role of four different countries that were trying to influence uh, the Trump administration, including the Emiratis. So when we see these two meetings and the role of George Nader, who doesn't appear to have any Russian connections, he is a, a real ally of the Emiratis, we right. understand that he's starting to look further in the role that they were playing here. Right. And, and, and as Shimon, of course, this comes as, you know, the Washington Post, as Kara points out, has reported that Mexico, the Emirates, Israel and China were trying to manipulate Jared Kushner, again, back to Jared Kushner, uh, for perhaps his political inexperience. Times is reporting that former Trump deputy campaign manager Rick Gates has agreed to plead guilty to fraud. That makes him the third person that we know of to cooperate with special counsel Robert Mueller. Now, according to the L.A. Times, Rick Gates is going to plead uh, guilty. He will testify against Paul Manafort. That's his co-defendant in this case. It was a criminal case re regarding financial crimes before he had anything to do with the presidential campaign. Now, both of these men pleaded not guilty to those charges. So, you know, it's obviously a worrisome development for Paul Manafort. The fact that his co-defendant in this case is willing to engage in this plea deal and then testify against him. Now, according to the L.A. Times, Rick Gates could spend about 18 months in prison. And just to give you a little bit of context, the charges he was facing, he could have faced upwards of 10 years in prison if he had gone to trial and if he had been found guilty. Now, this is a person who has a young family. He has four young children. He was facing personal pressure from his loved ones to kind of get this over with. But he was also facing financial pressure. It would have been very expensive for him to continue with this, to go to trial. Nothing about the guilty plea or the charge implicates anyone other than Mr. Flynn. Good evening. Those are the words of White House lawyer Ty Cobb. Tonight, to the contrary, the many implications for current and former senior transition and administration officials of former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn's guilty plea in the Russian investigation. The many ways it suggests there may be far more to come because he also agreed to cooperate with special counsel Robert Mueller. The many ways it undermines virtually everything the president and his surrogates have been saying about Russia for month after month after month. The many ways it fills in pieces of a fact picture and a potentially very bleak picture for the White House, people close to the president, notably son-in-law Jared Kushner, and perhaps even for the president himself. Flynn's admission that he lied to the FBI about contact with Russia's ambassador to the United States again and again and again. However, former Lieutenant General, former Defense Intelligence uh, Agency Director, former National Security Advisor to the President of the United States is no mere co coffee boy. He was central to the campaign and central to the transition. Now, simply put, part of the very tight inner circle, a big fish, and now for Robert Mueller, a big catch, possibly illegal attempts to conduct foreign policy and then lying about it during his brief tenure as National Security Advisor. Well, first, let me say, and I know that this may seem kind of artificial to, to folks, I can't really talk about what General Flynn's underlying conduct was because that's based on classified information. So according to the charging document on or about the 28th of December, as President Obama announces sanctions, Kislyak contacts Flynn. 
On or about the next day, Flynn contacts a senior transition official at Mar-a-Lago. Then he calls Kislyak and, according to the charging document, later lies about it to the FBI. To the president, he was the, the designee as the national security advisor to the president, probably starting in December. And he came to our attention in the early part of January when there were statements made by the vice president in public about interactions that Flynn, as the national security advisor designee, had had with the Russians. And we knew those representations were very different than what the facts were. And given that we already had a case open to understand whether any Americans were working with the Russians as part of their effort to undermine our democracy, trying to figure out what was going on there was very important to us. What did you think when you found out that the national security advisor designee was lying about conversations with the Russian ambassador? Why is he lying? Was Do you the know question. the answer? I still don't know the answer to that. So again, I have a limited vantage point, but it was clear that he was lying, that he lied to two FBI agents on the 24th of January in the Situation Room in a conference room, and it was clear that he was lying. But the why was really interesting to us, and I didn't get that, I wouldn't tell you that answer if I found it, but I didn't get it before I left, was fired in May. You look at this White House now, and it's hard to imagine two FBI agents ending up in the sit room. How did that happen? I sent them. Um, <laughs> Um, something we, I probably wouldn't have done or maybe gotten away with in a more organized investigation, a more organized administration, in the George W. Bush administration, for example, or the Obama administration, <laughs> the protocol, two men that all of us have perhaps increased appreciation for uh, over the last two years. <laughs> and in both of those administrations, there was process, and so if the FBI wanted to send agents into the White House itself to interview a senior official, you would work through the White House counsel and there'd be discussions and approvals and who would be there. And I thought it's early enough, let's just send a couple guys over. <laughs> and so uh, we placed a call to Flynn, said, hey, we're sending a couple guys over. Uh, hope you'll talk to them. He said, sure. Nobody else was there. They interviewed him in a conference room at the White House Situation Room, and he lied to them. And that's what he's now pled guilty to. What did he think they were coming over there for? Uh, I don't think he knew. I, no, we didn't tell him. Just said, we've got a couple, sending over a couple of agents. Uh, I want to ask you some questions. I didn't have this conversation. My deputy director did. But hope, uh, hope you got a few minutes. You can sit down and talk to them. And he said, sure. Okay, I have a six-year-old, and so this is a question I hear all the time that I'm going to ask you. What happened next? That's also what federal prosecutors do in court, so that you're, <laughs> you're ready. Uh, what happened next was that he lied, and then the investigation continued to try and understand the whys behind that, locking down the lies, but also trying to understand what, what was behind that. And so it was an active investigation when on Valentine's Day I was in the Oval Office for the first counterterrorism briefing of the new president, where I had a prominent role because I was to tell him what the threat is inside the United States, and I had some pretty hair-raising stuff to tell him, and he seemed distracted, and then, I don't think he asked questions, and then at the end, kicked everybody else out saying he wanted to speak to me alone. And what did he say? He said he wanted to talk about Mike Flynn. And then in substance, in that conversation, he asked me, which I took as a direction, to let it go. That he's a good guy. I hope you'll uh, let it go. And I, I didn't let it go. And good evening. We begin tonight with breaking news. A federal judge late today ruling that Paul Manafort, President Trump's former campaign chairman, lied to the FBI, lied to a grand jury, lied to Robert Mueller's investigators, lied intentionally on multiple occasions, lied about contact with Russians, and he's supposed to be a cooperating witness. As you might imagine, as we so often find ourselves saying, this is a big development, and CNN's Evan Perez joins us now with the latest. Just walk us through exactly what was and, not, what was, and what was not in this ruling. Well, Anderson, uh, prosecutors from the special counsel's office had initially accused Paul Manafort 
of lying on five different occasions, five different topics uh, during the time that he was supposed to be cooperating. If you remember, he had pleaded guilty and he had agreed to cooperate as part of this investigation. And so he had met with prosecutors over many, many hours uh, of what they call proffer sessions. And during that time, he was lying, according to the prosecutors, according to the judge and her ruling today, that she said that there was enough evidence to show that he lied in at least three of those occasions. Uh, one of them had to do with a payment that he, uh, that he had received to help pay for some of his legal bills, and two of them had to do with Konstantin Kalimnik, is the name we've heard a lot, obviously, over the course of this investigation, somebody who is going to figure, I think, very importantly in this investigation. And one of those meetings was in, in August of 2016 at the Havana Club uh, a cigar bar in, uh, in New York. And according to the prosecutors, there were, this is where there was an exchange of information. Perhaps uh, th th this is where uh, Manafort provided this polling data, this internal Trump polling data that they say figures largely in this investigation. Now, it's important to note that Manafort's attorneys say he didn't actually lie, that uh, he misremembered certain facts. They also say, uh, they also hinted in, in the court hearing uh, that Kalimnik is not exactly what the, the prosecutors are making him out to be. That, you know, obviously uh, prosecutors say that he was essentially a spy for the Russians. Manafort's attorneys suggest that he was meeting with, uh, with diplomats from the uh, U.S. Embassy in Kiev. Yeah, the judge said that there were two points which they did not prove. Yeah, but I mean, let's, you know, we can talk about the political implications, but I saw Paul Manafort in court the other day. This is a man who looks like he's dying. He is walking with a cane. He looks disoriented. He has declined so precipitously in, in prison that when you realize he has now lost his cooperation agreement and the chance for a lower sentence, and he's facing <clears throat> an entirely separate prison sentence in the Virginia case, a 70-year-old man is looking like he may die in prison, and it is just a profound thing to think about. We're showing video, but that, that's probably older. No, video. this that, is th this is how we remember him yeah, right. as as you know, and I, and you know, the, this is how he became a public figure during the, the this investigation. Right. He is almost unrecognizable really? today from that, um, from this video. Almost unrecognizable. You know, he he's got gout. He's walking with a cane. Apparently, he's using a wheelchair a lot of the time. Prison is rough for anybody, and you know, yes, he did wrong, and he did wrong over and over again. But, I mean, this man is really, really in danger of losing his life. Shan? This is CNN Breaking News. Uh, breaking uh, news on Roger Stone. I want to go to Shimon Procupes for the latest on that. Shimon? Uh, yeah, that's right, Anderson. This is ongoing uh, as we speak. We have people inside the courtroom. Roger Stone has been found guilty after a, a week and a half trial, a jury that's been deliberating now for close to nine hours. They are now returning their verdict, still ongoing. But so far, Roger Stone has been found guilty of four, four different counts uh, out of the seven. We're still getting word from inside the courtroom. He's been found guilty of making false statements. Uh, he's also been found guilty of obstruction. Of course, this all having to do with his appearance before members of Congress who were investigating Russian interference and specifically his contact with WikiLeaks, but then more importantly, Anderson, his contact with the Trump campaign and Donald Trump himself. Uh, prosecutors here putting on a case accusing Roger Stone. He has now been found guilty uh, of having these communications with the Trump campaign, senior level people inside the campaign, as well as Donald Trump himself. Prosecutors saying that he lied. The jury here now agreeing finding him guilty on those counts, saying that he lied to members of Congress uh, when he appeared before them and trying to not tell them the truth, essentially, about his contacts with WikiLeaks, people believed to be intermediaries, but more importantly, obviously, the Trump campaign. This all stemming from the Mueller investigation, of course. And do you remember the last words that the closing argument prosecutors gave was, the truth still matters, okay? They were able to see through this even a broken clock is right twice a day sort of scenario that Roger Stone did. And even more importantly, this is the same team that was working with the Mueller probe who was, as we all know, was interested in about the welcome acceptance and why there was such an interest in foreign nations to interfere and influence the election. And keep in mind, it interfered with the committee's ability to assess and evaluate data and evidence 
call other witnesses, follow different evidentiary trails when Roger Stone refused and lied to information, refused to give information. So this is very much a consequence of that act activity. No one was ever indicted for the conspiracy-related crimes in the Mueller probe, but it's equally important to think about how the consequences of Roger Stone's inability to either tell the truth or to provide truthful information at a crucial time stymied other congressional and Mueller-related investigations. This is essentially the jury saying, no, no, the truth did matter. We saw right through it, and coincidences just don't happen like that. And, yeah, and we've been so focused, rightly so, on what we're seeing today with these dramatic uh, impeachment hearings focused on the Ukraine, things that the president did while in office. But remember, <laughs> this is about allegations that have never gone away. Um, no, the, the, the Mueller team, his report could not prove collusion, but this is maybe one person removed, collusion. collusion. That's what WikiLeaks is. Yeah. WikiLeaks, according to our uh, intelligence officials and so forth, it is a, an arm of the Russian government. Yeah. And you have a candidate on the phone in the call that Gloria just described staying up to speed. Now, is he actually talking to the WikiLeaks people? No. To the Russians? No. Bannon today busted on a yacht off the coast of Connecticut. And in yet another note of delicious irony, those doing the arresting were law enforcement officials with the U.S. Postal Service. Bannon charged by federal prosecutors with conspiracy to commit wire fraud and money laundering. Bannon and three other men accused of orchestrating a scheme to defraud donors, taking more than a million dollars donated to the group, quote, we build the wall. Bannon joins, of course, a long list of Trump campaign officials and associates who have been charged or convicted of various crimes. FBI lawyer Lisa Page and FBI agent Peter Strzok from August the 8th of 2016. In that text exchange, Lisa Page wrote, Trump's not ever going to become president, right with a question mark, and then right with a question mark and an exclamation point in case anybody uh, reading it may have missed the uh, point of her emphasis. Peter Strzok responded, no. No, he's not. We'll stop it. Do I have that text exchange right? Uh, you do. Now, Lisa Page was an FBI lawyer who worked on the Clinton email investigation. That's correct. Uh, did she also work on the Russia investigation? Uh, she did. How about the Mueller special counsel team? Uh, she did for a period of time. All right. So we're three for three on her working on the two most important bureau investigations in 2016 and beyond. Now, is this the same Lisa Page that Andy McCabe used to leak information to a news outlet? Um, she was his special counsel, and as we indicated in our earlier report, she was the individual through whom he provided that information. Wasn't there also a text about an insurance policy in case Trump won in a meeting in Andy's office? She was part of that text string, too, wasn't she? Correct. That was on August 15. All right, so this August 8 text was not the only time FBI lawyer Lisa Page was able to use the text feature on her phone. This is the same Lisa Page who admonished the agent interviewing Hillary Clinton not to go into that interview loaded for bear because Clinton might be the next president. And it's the same Lisa Page who said Trump was loathsome, awful. The man cannot become president. Clinton just has to win and that Trump should go F himself. Now, most of those comments were before the Clinton investigation was over, and we are somehow supposed to believe that she did not prejudge the outcome of that investigation before it was over. She already had Hillary Clinton winning. I don't know how you can win if you're going to wind up getting indicted and or plead guilty or be convicted of a felony. So... Um, I think we understand the first half of that text pretty well. Um, she didn't want Trump to win, and she wanted Clinton to win. Now for the response. Senior FBI agent Peter Strzok wrote, no, no, he's not. We'll stop it. Now, I think this is the same Peter Strzok who worked on the Clinton email investigation. Do I have that right? Uh, that's correct. Same Peter Strzok who not only worked on the Russia investigation when it began, but was one of the lead investigators at the inception of the Russia Pro. Do I have the right Peter Strzok? That's my understanding. Now, is it the same Peter Strzok who was put on the Mueller special counsel team? Yes. All right. Same Peter Strzok. 
And this is not the only time he managed to find the text feature on his phone either. This is the same Peter Strzok who said Trump is an idiot. Hillary should win 100 million to zero. Now, Mr. Inspector General, that one is interesting to me because he's supposed to be investigating her for violations of the Espionage Act at the time he wrote that, in March of 2016. He's supposed to be investigating her for violations of the Espionage Act, and he can't think of a single solitary American that wouldn't vote for her for president. I mean, can you see our skepticism? This senior FBI agent not only had her running, he had her winning a hundred million to nothing. So what if they'd found evidence sufficient to indict her? What if they had indicted her? Is this the same Peters? He wasn't part of the interview of Secretary Clinton, was he? Uh, he was present for the interview. Huh. So four months before that interview where he was present, he's got her running and winning $100 million to zero. And it's the same Peter Strzok who wrote the bigoted nonsense of Trump. Trump's a disaster. I have no idea how destabilizing his presidency would be. He wrote, F Trump. Trump is an effing idiot. On the prospects of Trump winning, he wrote, this is an effing terrifying in addition to seeming to like uh, the F word, I think we have the same FBI agent Lisa Page and the same FBI agent Peter Strzok working on the Clinton email investigation, the Russia probe, and on Mueller's team. So we have the right text and we got the right people. I want to make sure we have the chronology right. July 5th, 2016, Comey announces no charges for Secretary Clinton, right? Correct. July 28th, 2016. The FBI initiates a counterintelligence investigation into Russia and the Trump campaign. And Strzok is not only on that Russia investigatory team, he's actually leading it. So that's three weeks after Clinton is exonerated by Comey, Strzok is leading an investigation into Russia and possible connections with the Trump campaign. That's on the 28th of July. Now, on the, 20, on the 31st of July, three days after the Russia investigation began, Strzok wrote, damn, this feels momentous. The other one did too, but this was to ensure we didn't F things up. This one matters because it matters. And if you happen to not know how important it is, he went ahead and put matters in all caps in case you happen to not focus on the importance of why this matters. Now, her investigation was just to make sure they didn't F things up. This one, we're three days into it, Inspector General Horowitz, three days into an investigation, but this one really matters. I wonder what he meant by saying the purpose of the Clinton investigation was to make sure they didn't F things up, but the Russia investigation, nah, that one was different. That one really mattered. You know, it almost sounds, Inspector General Horowitz, like they were going through the motions with the Clinton investigation. But boy, they sure were excited about the Russia one. Then we get to August 6th. This is less than 10 days after the Russia investigation begins, and Page says, you are meant to protect the country from that menace. And then we get to August 8th, 2016, less than two weeks after the Russia investigation even began, the lead FBI agent says he will stop Trump from becoming president. This is two weeks into an investigation. And he's already prejudged the outcome. And we're somehow supposed to believe that that bias was not outcome determinative. I can't think of anything more outcome determinative than my bias against this person I'm investigating with only two weeks' worth of investigating. I have already concluded he should not be the President of the United States. And then we get to August 15th, just over two weeks into the Russia investigation. Strzok says, I want to believe the path you threw out, that there's no way he gets elected, but I'm afraid we can't take that risk. It's like an insurance policy. Mr. Inspector General, that is two weeks 
into an investigation, and he is talking about taking out an insurance policy because he can't fathom the target of his investigation possibly becoming the president. So I want to go back to the no, no, he's not going to be president. We'll stop it. What do you think the it is in that phrase, we'll stop it? Oh, I think it's clear from the context. It's we're going to stop um, him from becoming president. That's what I thought, too. Now, I wonder who the we is and the we'll stop it. Who do you think the we is? Well, I think that's probably subject to multiple interpretations. We'll see if we can go through a couple of them or the broader or a broader group beyond that. I mean, it's hard to fathom a definition of we that doesn't include him. So we know he's part of we. You could assume that the person he's talking with is FBI attorney who also happens to be working on the Russia investigation. She may be part of the we. But I wonder, Inspector General, did you find any other FBI agents or FBI attorneys who manifest any animus or bias against President Trump? Uh, we did. How many? Uh, we had found three additional FBI agents, as we detail in the report. And were any of them working uh, on the Russia investigation? Sorry, or let, me, let me just write two agents and one attorney. Two other agents, one other attorney. Were they working on either the Russia investigation or the Mueller probe? Uh, uh, I believe two of the three were, but I'd have to just double check on that. Okay. Now, Bob Mueller was named special counsel on May the 17th, 2017. One day later, Mr. Horowitz, one day later, Peter Strzok is back on his phone texting some more. For me, in this case, I personally have a sense of unfinished business. I unleashed it with the Clinton email investigation. Now I need to fix it and finish it. Fix what? Uh, well, there is outlined in the report what Mr. Strzok's explanation for. Oh, I know what he said. was. I I'm asking our the, view. I'm was, asking the guy who had a distinguished career in the Southern right. District of New York and had a distinguished career at the Department of Justice. Uh, would you rather cross-examine Peter Strzok on that explanation, or would you rather direct the examination on that explanation? Uh, probably cross-examine. That's what I thought. Uh, How about finish it? When he said, I unleashed it, now I need to fix it and finish it. What do you think he meant by finish it? I think in the context of the emails that occurred in August, and the prior August that you outlined, I think... Um, a reasonable explanation of it or a reasonable inference of that is uh, that he uh, believed he would use or potentially use his official authority to take action. But this is 24 hours into him being put on the Mueller probe. There's no way he possibly could have prejudged the outcome of the investigation. 20... Maybe he did. Maybe that's the outcome determinative bias that my Democrat friends have such a hard time finding. Uh, Inspector General Horowitz, if one of your investigators talked about Lisa Page and Peter Strzok the way they talked about Donald Trump, would you have left them on the IG investigation? Uh, no. Did you ever have an agent when you were a prosecutor with this level of bias? Uh, you know, as I've laid out here, I thought this was completely antithetical to the core values of the department and extremely serious. Can you speak up, please? I'm sorry. Um, I heard you. I, but you can say it where Mr. Nadler can hear you, too. I, um, you know, my view of this was that this was extremely serious, completely antithetical to the core values. In my personal view, having been a prosecutor and worked with FBI agents, I can't imagine FBI agents suggesting, even, that they might use their powers to um, investigate frankly, any candidate for any office. Well, I can't either. And I'll, let me ask you this in conclusion. I think you've already, you, you laid out in your opening that Peter Strzok's obsession with Donald Trump and the Russia investigation may have led him to take his eyes off of the Wiener laptop and um, in a, in a uh, notably ironic way uh, caused Jim Comey to be a little bit later in sending those letters to Congress so that is one example of outcome determinative bias. Uh, but I got to ask you, you used to, 
used to be in a courtroom. You were on the side of the United States, and you worked for the Department of Justice. If someone is prejudging the outcome of an investigation before it ends, and someone is prejudging the outcome of an investigation before it even begins, <laughs> what is more textbook bias than prejudging this investigation before it's over and this one before it begins? I am struggling to find a better example of outcome determinative bias than that. So what am I missing? Well, I think uh, certainly with regard to the Russia investigation you mentioned, as you know, we are looking at that in an ongoing way. Uh, with regard to the Clinton email investigation, I think as we lay out here and go through it, we looked at text messages, emails, documents to try and assess whether the specific decisions that we were asked to look at and then the ultimate prosecutorial decision were impacted by Struck page and the others' views. And what we ended up finding, particularly as to the prosecutor's decision, was um, that that was a decision they made exercising their discretion on their view of the policy, the law, and the facts as it was found. Um, we've laid that out. And in our view, we didn't find or see um, evidence that the prosecutors were impacted by that bias. Um, but as I mentioned in my opening statement, the idea here was to put out the facts um, for the public, members of Congress to see, and, um, and so that folks who want to take a look at those issues obviously can um, assess them themselves. Well, my time is up. I hope one of my other colleagues will uh, explore that because uh, the explanation I've heard is that the failure to prosecute was predicated upon their belief that there was not sufficient evidence of intent on her behalf. And I don't know where in the hell you would go to find better evidence of intent than interviewing the person who actually was doing the intending. And when you make up your mind that you're not going to charge someone and you make up your mind that you need to not go in loaded for bear, and then you read the 302 and there's not a single damn question on intent, it is really hard for those of us who used to do this for a living to not conclude they'd made up their mind on intent before they even bothered to talk to the single best repository of intent evidence, which would be her. With that, I would Mr. Mr. Chairman, may, may I make an